Good evening. My name is Allison Kaplan. I'm Director of Education at the National First Ladies Library, located at the National First Ladies Historic Site in Canton, Ohio. It looks like my microphone is working. One issue we've been having lately that I just want to remind people is sometimes the um, program is a little clunky through Eventbrite. So if you're logged in through Eventbrite, what we recommend, and again, I will put it in the chat as well as I get started here, um, is to click on the program if you're an Eventbrite and it will take you out into Zoom. So you likely should be able to hear, but again, we encourage people if you have any issues to please contact us um, either through the chat or via email, and we are happy to sit and troubleshoot with you and get you on. I wanted to also let you know that we do record our programs and post them to um, the organization's YouTube page, and we're also live on Facebook. So hopefully you sound okay, or I sound okay, and you can hear me. Sometimes I get distracted by the chat, but I'm seeing that we have a huge crowd tonight, which is very excited to me because again, we are coming to you from very snowy Canton, Ohio, uh, the hometown of Ida McKinley. So we are very excited to have this as one of tonight's of our programs related to cooking with the First Ladies. And if you can't make it to the National First Ladies Historic Site to visit Ida McKinley's home, um, hopefully you can connect with us tonight and watch this program and learn a little bit about Ida, because she is very beloved to us, and I think she will be to you as well by the end of the evening. Before we get started, I want to tell you a little bit about some of our other upcoming programs that you might have seen scrolling by on the screen there. Um, so if you have any New Year's resolutions um, regarding eating, you should probably throw them out the window tonight. Um, but if you are like me and you have some related to cooking some meals at home, the National First Ladies Library is going to be your go-to website for um, that that resolution uh, related to uh, Sarah's program this evening. And then we have some really cool upcoming programs um, that are discussion based. So I'll tell you about two of them. We have a film discussion. We partner with our local library, Stark Library, which is right down the street with us to show documentaries that you can screen at home um, via their Hoopla site. And your local library may have that as well. Um, we partner with ours and um, they have been really great to share links with out of state people and encourage people to sign up if they're in Ohio for um, cards through them online. So we've been trying to do most of our films as streaming through the library. So we stream a film and watch it on our own time at home and then get together and discuss it. And it's anything from topics related to first ladies, to women's history, to uh, women in sports. Um, so we are returning to that theme of women in sports and screening a documentary called Glow about the glorious ladies of wrestling. I'm super excited about it because I grew up watching them. So that is February 8th and you can head over to our Eventbrite. I will post links um, in the chat in a little bit. We also have a great curator talk. Um, if you haven't joined us for our curator series, pre-COVID, they were all in person. We donned white gloves. We got to see amazing objects in um, National First Ladies Library collection. They are just as cool online because you get to connect directly with our um, director of archives and she takes you into our archives and shows you a really cool object in the collection and tells you a little bit about it. So um, we are looking at a letter um, written by Grace Coolidge to a friend and um, I'm really excited for that, that should be really fun. Um, I don't know if you knew this, but President's Day is coming up 
and um, we're really excited to celebrate it as usual, but we are also going to be celebrating the ladies. We don't want to forget about them, so if you have a grandchild, a child at home, um, or a teacher or some um, caregiver that you want to pass the information along to, we have our Fun with Flotus Children's Program next month, which will be live um, for First Ladies Day, so the day after uh, President's Day, we're going to be celebrating First Ladies Day with some games and some activities at home. So we're really excited for that. And that's February 22nd. So we hope that um, if you have a, a child at home that is curious about history and women in history, that you will join us on Zoom and um, celebrate some of those gals. And then February 28th, if you have a New Year's resolution to read this year, we have a really great lineup of book club books. We have all four of them posted on our Eventbrite, so you can dig in and add them all to your Goodreads or your reading list. Um, so February 28th, we are reading a fictional book this time. It's by Curtis Sidenfeld. It's called Rodham. And it posits, what if Hillary Clinton um, broke up with Bill Clinton? And um, what would her life have looked like? And what would she have gone on to do? Um, I really love Curtis Sidenfeld. I think this is a interesting quick one and it should be a really great discussion. Um, we also have some really amazing nonfiction books that we're going to take a look at. I just finished the one about Nancy Reagan and I could not put it down. So I think um, I really encourage you to go check out that list. I think we're going to have a wonderful year of exploring women's history, exploring the first ladies, um, and connecting with people all over the country and all over the world to discuss them. So with that, um, I want to encourage you to head to our Eventbrite page and get online. Um, we also have some really cool uh, social media opportunities coming up, um, activities and some interesting things and posts about um, African-American women who worked at the White House, um, craft activities related to creating your own mood ring um, inspired by Betty Ford. So really cool stuff. Um, I'm excited about it, but I am most excited to pass things over this evening to our hostess with the mostest, Sarah Morgan. So armed with a bachelor's degree in history, um, Sarah had a faded moment at the thrift store where she came upon the Cooking with the First Ladies um, book, the book, the First Ladies cookbook, um, and birthed the Cooking with the First Ladies Instagram. And we have been so happy to connect connect with her and partner with her for some really fun and amazing programs that take us sort of on a pop culture um, historical jaunt through First Lady history. And tonight we will be examining Canton's own Ida McKinley. So I'm going to turn things over to Sarah and I will be in the chat. And if you have questions for Sarah throughout the evening, I will compile them for her and we'll meet back up at the end of the program program. Thank you so much and welcome Sarah. Awesome. Well, hey all again, I'm Sarah Morgan and so welcome to Cooking with First Ladies Live. Um, so Ida McKinley was described as basically strikingly beautiful and charming and she not only adapted the role uh, really due to her disabilities, uh, but was the first formally educated First Lady at that time. Uh, so I actually had the pleasure this past fall to visit the National First Ladies Library and meet all the ladies in person, which was awesome, and a tour the Saxton McKinley House where Ida grew up. Um, so this evening, um, we're going to you know, talk a little bit about the pre-progressive pre era, excuse me, as well as Ida McKinley, um, who, although she was very courteous and refined, she really ignored uh, social norms and stood out um, amongst women of the era. Uh, then we're going to make a McKinley omelet, a lobster salad, chicken croquettes, and the Saxon sisters' own pumpkin pie. Um, so um, with further ado, we're going to start the evening with a cocktail. Um, now, the uh, Gilded Age uh, was also known as the Golden Age of Cocktails. Uh, so the cocktail we're going to be making this evening is the Remember the Main. Now, it was named in 1933 before the Cuban uprising, and that was in reference to the USS Maine explosion 
during the Spanish-American War of 1898, which Ida lived through as First Lady. Um, so what we're going to do for this one, you're going to want um, any type of little cocktail glass or you can use a martini glass. Um, and you are going to first take your chilled cocktail glass and you're going to add some absinthe. Um, so we're not going to make absinthe like with the sugar and type the, you know, the traditional way, uh, but you're going to take half a teaspoon of your absinthe. Put that in your chilled glass. And then you're going to swirl that around um, just so it kind of coats the outside of your glass. Just a little bit. And then you're not gonna actually leave all of your absinthe in there. Um, you're gonna discard the rest. Um, and then you're going to add two ounces of rye whiskey. Two ounces, um, I'm, excuse me, three fourths ounces of sweet vermouth. Uh, and two teaspoons of cherry liqueur. Uh, so finally, once you have mixed all of this together, we're gonna pop over here. I'm gonna get just a little bit of ice and we're going to swirl it, strain it, and put it back into our glass. So let's get just a little bit of ice. All right, and then you're gonna take uh, a little glass here. You're gonna strain, a lot of steps in this particular cocktail. Discard your ice, because that doesn't look pretty in your glass. And you're gonna take your strained, remember the main cocktail, put it back like that. And you are gonna garnish that with a brandied cherry. Not making this cocktail super well, but there you go. So there's the remember main, the remember the main. And so, as they said uh, back in 1898, the hell with Spain. Remember the main. Uh, so um, uh, Ida, uh, although we're making a cocktail this evening, uh, she really uh, didn't, uh, as to most people, serve alcohol at the White House. But that's kind of a myth uh, because she did actually allow alcohol to be served. Uh, but it was kind of reported in the press that she didn't. So the women's temperance movement um, actually tried to make her their new heroine, uh, believing that she would help support their cause. However, uh, they were extremely mistaken because Ida actually allowed all types of alcohol to be served at the White House. Really, she did not really partake uh, really no more than a glass of wine every now and again, but she absolutely never supported the women's temperance efforts. Um, or institute a dry policy at the White House, even with the urging of her friends. Uh, so before we get to the cooking portion, I'm gonna pop over here and share a little bit of a PowerPoint presentation about Ida and the pre-progressive era. Um, Allison, can you let me share my screen? Oh, thanks. Um, okay, so the pre-progressive era of the late 1800s, also known as the Gilded Age, branded by Mark Twain as such because it was, quote, glittering on the surface but corrupt underneath, was a time when Americans began to question the fundamental values they lived by. The era was branded with other names as well, such as the Nifty 90s, and especially during the mid-1900s, filmmakers took an interest in the decade with films such as Hello, Dolly, and a Mickey Mouse cartoon, The Nifty 90s. During this time, people wanted to solve the widespread poverty, unfair work conditions, and especially for that of children, because over 2 million worked in mines, mills, and factories in the 1890s, 
um, as well as violence and the need for voting rights for women as well as African Americans. Women not only attempted to champion the social causes of others, involving themselves in the temperance movement and the issue of those in poverty, but also their own as well uh, with the suffrage movement. Uh, the 1890s ushered in extraordinary changes from fashions to foods to opportunities, but was also plagued by human suffering and the overwhelming need for change. Large scale immigration during the late 1800s led to much of the conflicts and racial tensions that arose during the decade due to the vast incoming of new customs and ideas. Jane Addams, who was one of the first American women to win a Nobel Peace Prize, created Hull House, which assisted immigrants in blending into American culture and furthered the movement for reform. Uh, this is a particular example of how women wanted to fulfill their role in modern life by being one of the most outspoken groups in regards to problems of the racial injustice, child abuse, immigration, alcoholism, and suffrage. The era was also known as the Industrial Revolution due to the decades after the Civil War booming with inventions such as the telephone, which was introduced in 1900, and motor cars. Marconi was dabbling with experiments that would lead to the invention of the radio, and the Wright brothers were starting to work on their airplane. In addition, the gramophone was invented and introduced in 1890s uh, by Emil Berliner, which improv improved on the phonograph. Other technological advances were running water, gas, and electricity, which all expanded to restaurants, stores, and schools. Uh, they also got sewer systems, all of which was more available during this decade. Electricity also led to street lighting, which made evening activities less threatening for both men and women. However, not all of the inventions of the 1890s were hits. Edison invented the phonograph doll, uh, which recited nursery rhymes that were pre-recorded on wax records. So when the disc wore out, which was pretty quickly, the doll would let out a hair-raising, petrifying scream. Parents, of course, demanded refunds after their children were basically traumatized, leading Edison to end the sale of the doll. As America became more urbanized and prosperous, which basically tripled after the Civil War and into the 1890s, the demand for more leisure activities and entertainment grew, which ranged from vaudeville shows to sports and extreme lifestyle changes. America at the turn of the century was fanatical about fads. Also, workers began to be offered more time off as well as vacation time. So Americans had more spare time than ever before because more concern was placed on their health, especially due to progressive era reform. One of the more popular uh, was vaudeville, a variety entertainment show featuring everything from acrobats and musicians to singers, comedians, and trained jugglers. In addition to vaudeville, the Boxing Gordon sisters were another popular act, and the four siblings spent the 1890s touring the country, captivating audiences by brawling one another in the ring, uh, which kind of sounds like a precursor to GLOW, which Allison was talking about earlier. Um, other shows included circuses, Wild West shows, such as Buffalo Bill Cody's, and traveling medicine, medicine shows, which offered entertainment with the addition of tonics, salves, and medical miracle elixirs. Amusement parks, such as the first and most popular, Coney Island, founded in 1897, began to offer thrilling rides, fun houses, peculiar sideshows, and affordable refreshments. Chicago was the birthplace of amusement parks as we know them today, after Paul Boynton opened his water chute in 1894. These parks led to resort locations or bathing resorts, such as the famous Atlantic City. Boardwalk piers, such as Ocean Pier, built in 1891, and Steel Pier in 1898, offered midway-style games, electric trolley rides, and introduced the roundabout in 1892, the wooden precursor to the Ferris wheel, which was first, in, first featured in Chicago's Lincoln Park in 1896. Uh, national parks also began to be created, such as Yellowstone, and Americans vacation to these nature preserve spots as well. The first world fairs were held in various cities across the country and offered Americans the opportunity to quote, tour the world in one place. They featured science exhibits, new technologies such as motion pictures, foreign villages and amusement park style entertainment. Some of the most notable world's fairs were held in Nashville in 1897 and Chicago in 1893 
which is also known for the crimes of America's first known serial killer, H.H. H. Holmes. Sporting events also began to take center stage during the last decade of the century. Baseball was by far America's favorite sport and one of the most famous players was Pete Browning, known as the Louisville Slugger. Basketball was invented in 1891 due to the need for an indoor sport between football and baseball seasons. Women not only participated in playing basketball with official rules set for them in 1899, but also walking, rowing, and canoeing, which were actually all considered sporting events at that time. The decades also saw a rise in the popularity of roller skating, golf, and tennis, as well as winter sports such as sleighing and ice skating. As it became more acceptable for women to to swim in the company of men, the sport also grew in popularity as not only competitive, but for leisure as well. One of the biggest crazes was bicycling. Uh, with the new chain driven Starley's Rover, which was invented in 1885, as well as another popular model, the Overman Victory Flyer. Even people who couldn't afford one were purchasing a bicycle. During the 1890s, internal combustion engines were, engines were added, which led to the invention of the motorcycle and was eventually used on four-wheel carriages, resulting in the first Ford quadricycle and the beginning of the age of the automobile. Automobile races also began with the first held in Chicago in 1896. Automobiling, basically joyriding, was a popular ultra chic pastime. However, in 1899, a news report stated that Quote, the auto girl is a worthy end of the century institution, but she will never be so numerous as her sisters, the bicycle girl and the golf girl. Sailboat, rowing, and also horse racing were all popular as well. Popular music included ragtime. Scott Joplin was known as the king of ragtime and in 1899 introduced the maple leaf rag. Other popular music was any of the patriotic marches by John Philip Sousa, and many enjoyed attending symphonies and concerts. Patriotism was popular just in general, in addition to the patriotic tunes, such as 1895's America the Beautiful, which symbolized America's westward expansion, and one of McKinley's main things that he's known for as president, um, and the Pledge of Allegiance, which was written by Francis Bellamy in 1892. Railroads boomed during the late 1800s, and with the advent of refrigerated cars back in 1870, allowed for regional foods such as Florida fruits and avocados from California to be available to those living in other parts of the country. Grocery store chains began to pop up in popular brands such as Campbell's Soup, with the first flavor being beefsteak tomato released in 1895, and Nabisco, or the National Biscuit Company with their first cracker, the Unita, and the Coca-Cola were all introduced in the 1890s. The newly expanded transportation also gave rise to suburbs because people could now live further away from their jobs. One of the other events of the 90s was the Klondike Gold Rush of 1898 and 99, when hundreds of men traveled to the Yukon Territory facing a long journey, potential death, treacherous conditions, just all with the hopes of striking it rich. The railroads also contributed to newspapers and magazines that were easily distributed nationwide, allowing the general public to be more informed. Advertising in the publications led Americans to strive for similar lifestyles and for the first time develop their own identity as a country. Mail order catalogs, such as Sears and Roebuck, founded in 1886, further expanded the ability for Americans to shop and for rural residents to follow the latest trends. In 1896, the first rule free delivery service was introduced, further making it much more convenient to use. New department stores and five and dime shops, such as Woolworths, gave Americans an entirely new way to shop, and the fashions began to change because women were starting to work outside of the home and wanted more simple and practical clothing. These affordable clothing were mass produced, and that changed the way Americans shopped because they were no longer relying on handmade. Uh, this also allowed differing social classes, immigrants, and regions across the country to blend together in what they were wearing. Although the years following the Civil War were a time of technological and industrial expansion, unlike anything the world had seen before, a downfall was the entrepreneurial greed of industry titans such as Rockefeller, Morgan, and Carnegie. These men accumulated more wealth than any in world history, but because of their dishonest dealings became known as robber barons. Corporations were controlling entire commodities and productions, leading to monopolies and the development of trusts. Ironically, 
their greed. Um, further, the uh, beginning of the progressive era and activists who argued for public ownership of railroads and other major monopolies. This led to yellow journalism, or as it is known today, investigative journalism. The Yellow Kid was a famous comic book character associated with yellow journalism featured in the comic strip Hogan's Alley from 1895 to 1898. McClure's magazine began publishing political and literary content in 1893, with one of the most famous journalists being Ida Tarbell, who was one of the first muckrakers, a term future president Teddy Roosevelt came up with because of their ability to uncover dirt. She wrote several exposés during her career, but most notably her investigation, sorry, her investigation into the Standard Oil Company led to the expansion and enforcement of legislation, including the Sherman Antitrust Act of 1890. These writers forever changed the role of journalism in the United States, and their writing was instrumental in fueling the progressivism political movement. Dime novels were published in libraries or biweekly series and only cost five cents each. These novels eventually led to pulp magazines named because of the cheap paper they were printed on back in the 1890s. Some of the most enjoyable topics of the era were revolutionary and Civil War stories, tales of the Wild West, which included books featuring Buffalo Bill Cody, historical romances, rags to riches tales, and detective fiction. Uh, authors such as Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, who wrote the famous Sherlock Holmes in 1892, and Robert Louis Stevenson's famous Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde came out in 1893. Another 1893 popular book was Beautiful Joe by Marshall Saunders and was told from the perspective of an optimist dog. Another peculiar piece of literature that became an unanticipated hit in 1895 was the poem Purple Cow by Gillette Burgess, who was so overwhelmed by the popularity, uh, he parodied, parodied his own work with a poem that went, Oh yes, I wrote the purple cow. I'm sorry now I wrote it, but I can tell you anyhow, I'd kill you if you quote it. In addition to weekly publications, these themes carried over to novels as well, many of which were based on exposing the difficulties of life during the era and lifestyle changes of Americans during the 1890s. Uh, they were reflected not only in this popular literature, but also serious novels and political articles that highlighted realism and focused on targeting the increasing middle class. Uh, Jacob Riss wrote How the Other Half Lives in 1890, which described life in the big city slums. And Edward Bellamy's Looking Backward, published in 1888, was actually set in the year 2000 and predicted there was no crime, poverty, or corruption, and everyone was working for equal pay, but also for a government-owned and operated trust. As the 1800s came to an end, life for every American across the nation had not only been changed by exciting inventions, but people had begun to realize that with their developing social conscience, they had the responsibility to take action and the duties that came with prosperity and power. The Saxons were a prominent family in the city of Canton and Ida uh, became known as the Belle of Canton. Ida Saxon McKinley was born in Canton, Ohio on June 8, 1847 in the house that still stands on Market Street. Ida grew um, up there and uh, is since become a historic site with tours available of the restored home. Uh, and it's also connected to the National First Ladies Library site. Uh, she and William also lived here from 1878 until 1891. The Saxon house has actually been passed down through four generations of the family, all through women, which supposedly makes it one of the only houses in America to have done so. Now, Ida's parents, James and Kate Saxon, were radically progressive and supported not only abolition, but also women's education and equality. James was uh, thought to be part of the Underground Railroad, and her mother sewed uh, voluntarily uniforms for the Civil War. Ida would assist her when she was home from Brook Hall Cemetery, a board, uh, seminary, excuse me, a boarding school in Pennsylvania where she attended with her sister, Mary, also known as Pina, which means little one. Ida also had a third sibling, a brother, who was ultimately murdered uh, in a national headline-making scandal after he left the family home heading to meet his lover. It was believed he was murdered by his former mistress, Anna George, but she was acquitted of the crime. Ida had many influences that mirrored her parents' progressive upbringing while at school, including her teacher, Harriet Galt, who taught her a love of hiking, as well as Betsy Cowles, 
who rather than give her a basic education, elaborated it to a variety of subjects, including finance. Although she was described as well-mannered and very feminine, Ida was also very athletic, independent and outspoken, which was unique for a time when it was not socially acceptable for women. Ida also became a refined pianist and developed a lifelong love of classical music, theater and opera, which would eventually lead to the revolution of including the first musical entertainment for dinner guests at the White House after formal occasions. After graduating from Brook Hall, Ida worked as a clerk and cashier at her father's bank. She later managed the Stark County Bank during his absence, which was radical for a woman during that time. And she often had to defend her right to work and to have an education. Prior to marriage, she also took a six month tour of Europe in 1869. And during this time studied intently. Ida also for the first time saw for herself harsh working conditions. In Belgium, she purchased a large quantity of handcrafted lace from women who were hardworking and severely underpaid. This ultimately led to her lifelong hobby of collecting handcrafted lace items. She also witnessed a man who could not only paint uh, with his mouth, uh, he could only paint with his mouth, I should say, because he had no arms or legs. And some feel that this uh, inspired her to live a life full, even with uh, her disabilities and led her to have a continued compassion for those struggling. Uh, she also not only studied extensively, but when she wrote home during her trip, uh, one letter said, quote, people ought to travel to see how much there is to learn and read. From this trip, she also returned with a music box from Switzerland as a gift to her mother, which is still on display at the Saxon McKinley House today. Ida first met Major William McKinley, who she later called the Major in 1868 at a picnic, but at the time was engaged to John Wright, who later died while she was on her European tour. They were reintroduced when he acted as her father's attorney, and after his approval of the relationship, the two began their courtship. In fact, William's relationship with the Saxons due to their prominence and status led him to rise to political greatness. She married William finally, who was at that time a distinguished and handsome lawyer on January 25th, 1871, when he was 27 and she was only 23. The wedding was held at the First Presbyterian Church in Canton, which her grandfather had helped establish. The wedding was a huge affair attended by hundreds, many of the residents of the area wanting a peek inside the brand new church, which at that time had yet to hold services. Several prominent politicians were invited, including Rutherford B. Hayes, who William had served with during the Civil War. The McKinleys had two daughters, Catherine Cady, who was born on Christmas Day of 1871, but sadly died of scarlet fever in 1875. Their second child, Ida, or little Ida, was only four months when she passed in 1873. The deaths of her daughters greatly affected Ida and sent her kind of into a deep depression. After their untimely passings, as well as attending a presentation about Hinduism and the principles of reincarnation, Ida became interested in Eastern religions and often continued to speak as if her children were still alive, especially Katie. They began to be referred to as the ghost girls or the lost girls and were depicted on various materials such as postcards and memorabilia related to the McKin McKinleys. Ida also began to believe so strongly in these concepts that she would especially visit with children when they would visit the White House, particularly young girls who would have been her daughter's age at that time. Around this time, Ida sustained an injury to her head and back after an incident in the carriage at her mother's burial so forceful they believe that this is what led to her late onset epilepsy, neurological damage to her leg, and led to her immune system to be compromised. Although she became relatively immobile, uh, she was never the invalid she has been cast as. After her illnesses began, her father helped William seek expert medical advice, and Ida was treated by a variety of well-known doctors who specialized in her condition. Ida was treated with bromide, but because William dosed her himself and essentially really didn't consult with a prescribing doctor regularly, he actually did a little bit more than good by accident because over-medicating with that substance led to more damage of the nerves. However, William did take superb care of her and made sure she had someone close in case of a seizure if he was not around. Finally, one doctor attempted to help her with a different approach, which included a strict diet, a regimen of exercise, and periods of scheduled rest. During her time as First Lady of Ohio, William showed his devotion publicly to Ida as he would always wave at her direction at their hotel suite at 3 p.m. every day from the Capitol. This would supposedly even occur when it was known by some that she was back in Ohio, but people saw this loyalty to his wife as a sign of a potentially great president. 
It was also during this period, William accidentally became caught up in a scandal involving the debts of a friend so large that he would potentially have to quit politics and return to his law profession. To prevent this from happening, Ida vowed she would use all of her money and inheritance to keep his political goals. After seeing her faith in him, advisors helped by raising money publicly to spare both of the McKinleys a financial loss. Ida finally joined William in Washington in 1877, and while she enjoyed attending social events, she mostly stayed at their hotel home and knit. During this time, she also occasionally served as social aide to First Lady Lucy Hayes, which gave her familiarity with the role and the White House. During the 1896 campaign, the rumors surrounding her ailments were so extensive, it was added to her husband's official biography and his interest in William as a candidate increased, Ida's health became a concern. Ida was at William's side as much as possible and he ran what was called his front porch campaign, primarily from Canton. And for the first time, a first lady's image appeared on a campaign pin. She was very present in the public eye through additional campaign materials, such as spoons and paper trays. This is one of the first instances of a candidate so extensively using their family in their campaign and showed the potential power and influence of a woman, especially in the role of first lady. Unfortunately, during this time, Ida suffered a bout of seizures, most likely brought on uh, by stress and the thousands of daily visitors to their home during the last few months of the campaign, which ultimately prevented her from continuing to make appearances in public. This led many to speculate about her health and rumors swirled she was mentally ill because at the time, a lot of people associated the disease with uh, mental illness. And in some instances, they called her invalid Ida. Many have said she was also severely depressed, but this was mostly attributed to her previous ability to be active, um, as well as being described as remarkably physically fit uh, than to you know, be going so restricted. Uh, finally, uh, William McKinley, when he was elected, uh, it did realign the political power in which Republicans would dominate for the next 20 years. Uh, Ida McKinley became first lady on March 4th, 1897, and became the first first lady to have any formal education, which would be equal to a bachelor's in fine arts today. During the inauguration, Ida uh, was determined to prove to the American people her strength and ability. She walked without help the entire length of Union Station and the steps to the box at the pension building for the ball. Um, although Ida was very fashionable, stylish, and into flashy jewelry, such as extravagant diamonds and pearls, she was not necessarily viewed as a fashion icon. And she supposedly wore her wedding dress for both the 1867 and 1901 inaugurations. She has been described as being, quote, magnificently costumed when she attended events. Her signature color was a beautiful pale blue. She loved ivory, but as much as she loved those colors, she absolutely disliked yellow. It didn't seem as though Ida wore much purple, which was the most popular color of the 1890s, with some referring to it as the mauve decade. Ida did dress in the high fashions of the era with signature high collars and puff sleeves, including one dress that was a white satin gown with a lace overlay extremely long train and was quote, high in the neck and long in the sleeves. When she wore an egret feather, however, in her hair, she caused quite the scandal and got in a little bit of trouble with the Audubon Society. Ida loved jewelry, diamonds in particular, and owned several stunning pieces. However, one of the most notable is her diamond tiara. Uh, it features wings on the side, which were removable and could be worn as brooches and it would have been purchased sometime between 1885 and 1906. Winged tiaras were vogue in the 19th century and were inspired by the Norse female figure Valkyrie. The wings, which each have approximately 100 diamonds each, is the center of one of the most interesting stories about Ida McKinley in recent years. The tiara, which was passed down through Ida's sister's family, ended up in the hands of Rick, owner of the famous Las Vegas gold and silver pawn shop and the A&E show Pawn Stars after it was sold by relatives. After authentication, Rick offered to sell the priceless piece, referred to by some curators of the McKinley Museum as the crown jewel of the United States, back to the establishment. It cost $43,000 for the museum to purchase the tiara, and afterwards, Rick donated the money to the National Epilepsy Foundation. In January of 1898, Ida was featured on the cover of Ladies Home Journal magazine, marking the first time uh, the magazine had photo. Uh, had featured a photograph rather than an illustration on the front page. 
There wasn't an article. However, they published the sheet music for the song, The Lady of the White House, written in 1897 by John Philip Sousa. As 25th First Lady, she was very passive as well as a silent political partner because she listened but didn't really participate. Uh, this was also the case during William's entire political career. While they were living upstairs in the Saxon home in Canton, he would keep the door open from his office to the living quarters and she would quietly listen but never interject herself. However, during wartime, she did become a little bit more politically engaged and increasingly involved in the McKinley presidency by influencing political appointments, critiquing his uh, speeches, but she always shared her views in private, oftentimes during carriage rides around the city. Uh, contrary to what some believe, Ida was never absent from any of her duties as first lady and did not allow her disorders to interrupt her day-to-day -day role. During their time at the White House, the McKinleys made a few adjustments to accommodate her health issues, which was that she held a bouquet of flowers and kept seated in a large armchair during formal receptions. She also allowed the wife of the vice president, Jenny Hobart, as well as her nieces to act as social aides during public events. Her sister, Mary Barber, frequented the White House as well to take care of her. Uh, they also changed the seating arrangements at official dinners so that she could be seated next to William. If a seizure did occur, he would cover her face with a cloth in order to conceal her distorted features, and many guests were respectfully discreet, saying to the press she had fainting spells. Although she didn't have any specific causes she stood for as First Lady, she publicly supported the Salvation Army and the Crittenden House, which had centers across the country that provided housing and meals for the homeless, impoverished, as well as women in need. These types of charitable institutions, Ida chose, modeled the general public concern with social and racial reform. She also continued to donate her knitted slippers, which amounted to over 3,000 pairs, to various charities for auction rather than making public appearances. In addition, from the time she arrived in Washington, Ida overcame expectations by not only refusing the use of a wheelchair, but acknowledging she had a chronic illness, which made her a role, role model for other dis disabled and immobile Americans. She also continued to advocate the higher education of women and not only went public with her support of women's suffrage, but was close friends with Susan B. Anthony. This made her the first first lady in office to support women's suffrage publicly. In 1899, she delivered speeches at two women's colleges. Also in 1899, Ida traveled alongside William to Smith College, where again, she not only spoke, but he became the first president to speak publicly about women's education. At the end of the 1800s, women were given more opportunities for higher education. And in fact, 20% of all college graduates by 1900 were women. And although many of them uh, struggled to find jobs, they worked in establishments such as settlement houses that focused on helping those in need and continuing the trend of progressive reform. She also spoke up for racial equality and supported African-Americans' right to education. In fact, she guaranteed the payment for private school for the children of one of the African-American women who worked washing clothes for her family. Ida's interest reflected the mindset of the decade and the end of the century hope for a new beginning. Another thing that set Ida apart from most other first ladies before or after her was that she showed very little interest in the history of the White House and uh, preferred a more modern style. She permitted no renovations during their tenure and claimed that she was fully committed to the city of Washington's 1900 centennial celebrations. Ida did, however, allow a journalist to come in and take an inventory of some of the historical White House pieces, mostly the China. During her tenure, she saw events such as the Spanish-American War in 1898, which only lasted 100 days. Uh, there was very little loss of American life, uh, but the United States was victorious over Spain. For the first time, the most powerful country in the Western Hemisphere, hemisphere was no longer Spain, but the United States. Referred to as a splendid little war, it changed the course of American history nonetheless. One of the examples uh, of that yellow journalism was stories published about the difficult conditions Cubans were living under Spanish rule, which led President McKinley to send that USS Maine to Havana in 1898. Uh, he was hoping to send the message of American expansion to the country and that America's military power uh, was very powerful uh, as a message to the Spanish. Unfortunately, the ship exploded, leading not only McKinley to take further action, but journalists to speculate the Spanish were involved. So going back to our cocktail, people were calling for everyone to remember the Maine. The public outcry fueled by journalism eventually is what started that Spanish-American War.
The McKinley presidency also focused on further territorial expansion, including the annexation of Hawaii and taking over the Philippines, Puerto Rico, and Guam, which furthered America's position as an imperial world power. During the Spanish-American War, Ida expressed interest in particular of the welfare of the Igorot tribe of the Philippines and was adamant in the United States retaining the country as a territory. Ida was insistent mostly because some say her study of Hinduism made her believe that her daughters may have been reincarnated as Filipino babies. Also, she absolutely did not order the drowning of cats during the war. Uh, she also supported Teddy Roosevelt and the Rough Riders. When Roosevelt could not get a train from Texas in order to get ships from Florida to Cuba, he wrote several telegraphs and letters, including one to Ida. Now later, uh, he said as she walked in in 1899, three cheers for Mrs. McKinley. Uh, during the campaign of 1900, both McKinleys took a lesser role in campaigning, uh, but they did have a transcontinental tour. Uh, while in Texas, Ida crossed the border into Mexi Mexico, making her the first known first lady to travel to a first foreign country. Um, she also fell very ill during this time from blood poisoning and led to a national concern for her health, and they had to stay in California until she recovered. It's one of the first instances a first lady's health condition was this extensively reported on. Uh, when she could, though, Ida continued to travel with the president throughout his second term, which included a trip to the Pan American Exposition in Buffalo, New York. The event was of importance because uh, to attend, it was a celebration of America's new power and place on the world stage. Uh, so what this video is, it's a silent film, and this is the first instance a first lady was captured on a movie camera. Afterwards, uh, she looked to visit Niagara Falls, excuse me, and take her doctor's scheduled rest. So therefore she was not there when he was shot in the receiving line at the Temple of Music. Um, President McKinley, he said, quote, be careful how you tell my wife. And as the crowd attacked the shooter, said for them to instead let justice take its course. Uh, sadly, McKinley did pass away a few days later. Now, after the assassination, Ida was said to have been relatively calm when told the news about her husband. Uh, she also talked to the press. As she walked without assistance down the street. Uh, William McKinley was originally in a holding vault awaiting completion of the burial monument. Uh, during the two and a half years, uh, Ida never left the house except really for daily visits to his grave, claiming she believed his ghost would return to her at the home. Now, eventually, uh, she did attend a few public events, including the ceremony for the laying of the cornerstone at the McKinley Monument. She also used her status to support equality uh, in federal appointed positions, uh, including James Benjamin Parker, the African-American who had attempted to stop the assassin from shooting President McKinley. Um, in regards to cooking, Ida took very little concern to the actual kitchen duties um, and really had no opinions as some first ladies do on what the menu would be served to guests. Uh, the McKinleys to this day are credited with hosting the largest scale as well as the longest and whop with whopping 71 courses dinner party at the White House. Ida also hosted a very unique event in February of 1901 that was the first time a state dinner, including dancing, the first time that ragtime was played and the first known in instance that Valentine's Day was uh, celebrated at the house as well. Her love of music and featuring performances at the White House even led one singer, Elsie Janis, to credit her with starting her career. Uh, she was uh, extremely involved in exactly what floral arrangements would be because she was an avid lover of flowers. She grew lots of them in the conservatory at the White House and would send bouquets to people and organizations she supported politically, uh, such as the suffrage convention. She gave Susan B. Anthony, who Ida also held an 80th birthday celebration for, a bundle of lilies and told her to tell the ladies at the convention they were from her. Uh, the McKinley's trademark flower, red carnations, which was the flower William wore in the buttonhole of his jacket and also kept a bouquet on his desk in the Oval Office to give to visitors, became the state flower of Ohio after his assassination. The McKinleys were said to have loved a big breakfast, especially eggs and starchy foods, and Ida was said to have had a big appetite not only for food but knowledge. One of the additional recipes included in the White House cookbook is one for red flannel hash, an Ohio classic. They also enjoyed a dish we will be making this evening, the lobster salad, on special occasions such as their anniversary. Ida also submitted a few recipes to various cookbooks, which included corn muffins, white layer cake, 
um, and chicken croquettes, which we'll be also making this evening. Um, all right, so um, I'm gonna stop this and let's get cooking. Okay, so I'm gonna pop our cocktail stuff out of the way. Uh, but the first dish that we are going to make this evening is chicken croquettes. Um, and I like to call chicken croquettes um, fancy chicken nuggets, uh, because that's basically what they are. Um, and so because we're so short on time always with our live videos, and some of these take hours, uh, you know, refrigeration wise and things, I will show you um, a finished product uh, when we're done, but I will give you the gist of how to make this. Uh, so what you're going to need is two cups of chopped chicken, cooked or minced. So we've got that. Um, and I've already mixed in um, our one teaspoon of powdered sage. Um, you're also going to need uh, cracker crumbs, chicken gravy, um, as well as an egg with two tablespoons of milk. Uh, so first what you're going to do is you're going to take about half of your cracker crumbs, your chicken, um, and your gravy. And this is gonna be a little messy. And you're gonna mix all these together. Let me grab a spoon. And you're gonna mix this together into like a paste. Um, so uh, one of the interesting fads while we mix this uh, during the 1890s was known as ring turning. Uh, basically, women, especially in office settings, uh, would go up to random men uh, and turn their ring on their finger. Uh, the superstition kind of went that when a woman meets a young man, uh, she turns this um, and she's to turn the ring two or three times. And she's supposed to do that basically to 24 different rings, 24 different men. Uh, and then the next one, uh, she's supposed to look for a married person, female or male and turn that ring twice, only twice on that one. And then after that, the next person that she meets will be her husband. So uh, that was one of the very weird fads. Uh, so once you've got that, then you just take your um, egg and milk mixture and you're gonna mix that in as well. And so you're basically just making a chicken paste is what you're doing. And you wanna make sure that it's thick enough that once you get this mixed up, you're gonna dip it into your cracker crumbs and then you kind of form it into a cone shape. So the croquettes are more of a cone shape rather than, uh, like I said, a fancy chicken nugget shape. Okay. So we're just gonna take a little bit, roll that up and form it best you can into a little type of cone shape. Okay, so I'm gonna get this out of the way and I'm gonna show you a finished batch of chicken croquettes, which you can serve with leftover chicken gravy, uh, which is also extremely easy uh, as well to make and they have tons of really uh, simple recipes online. Uh, okay. So what you'll get is Ida McKinley's chicken croquettes. Um, so what takes the longest with these is after you get those and you roll them up, then you're gonna wanna refrigerate those for two hours or overnight, fry them in your oil, and then serve them up with your leftover gravy. Okay, so next we are going to make the Saxton Sisters pumpkin pie. So you're gonna take um, two cups of canned pumpkin or cooked pumpkin that you've mashed yourself. Uh, and you are going to, in a bowl, beat your eggs really well. You've got three eggs there. And then into your pumpkin, you are going to add your eggs and your three-fourths cup brown sugar and all of your spices. So you've got nutmeg, ginger, cinnamon, a little bit of salt, pinch of ground cloves, and mix all of that together. And uh, we're going to 
not only mix this together, but uh, while we mix this and kind of move on to our next recipe, we are gonna go ahead and boil our evaporated milk. So you have to take this, you gotta bring it to a boil. And it's actually really pretty fast. So we'll boil that really quick, mix this up. Really simple pumpkin pie recipe that turns out really good. And also while you're doing this, you can either use a pre-baked uh, pie crust, make your own pie crust. So you'll have your pie crust ready to go to put your mix in. And then you're gonna bake it on 450 uh, for about an hour. Um, and then you can either bake your uh, chopped walnuts in with your mix, or you can wait until your pumpkin pie is done, top it with your chopped walnuts, and then broil it for about five minutes. Okay, so we're gonna set that aside for just one second while we wait for our milk to boil. And we're going to move on to our McKinley omelet. Just until our milk gets done and then we'll be ready for our pumpkin pie. Um, okay, so with your omelet, uh, your omelet, excuse me, you're gonna need your mixer. We've got our egg whites in here. You're also going to need egg yolks, um, as well um, as, excuse me, I lost my recipe, here it is. Um, if y'all got your cute little recipe cards in the mail, um, I use them while I'm cooking too. So you'll have your four egg yolks, your four egg whites, a third a cup of milk, um, and your cornstarch, baking powder, almond flouring, and a little bit of salt and pepper. So we're gonna mix up our egg, whites just until they're fluffy all right we're gonna add in our yolks milk and seasoning, as well as our cornstarch and baking powder. Mix that up just a little bit. And then this one is extremely simple because all you have to do once you've got it all mixed up together is pour it into a casserole dish, which is really weird because this isn't like an omelet like what you would necessarily consider an, om an omelet. We're almost ready to go on our milk. So really good timing. All right. So in your greased pan here, you're just gonna pour your egg mixture in and you are gonna bake this on 375 until it's brown on top. And it also does not take long at all to bake. Now uh, the McKinley's serve uh, their omelets or their eggs uh, with bacon on the side. Um, so. For me, I substituted in turkey bacon and you can garnish your McKinley omelet with a little bit of chopped parsley or you can also go with uh, chopped uh, cilantro uh, or chopped chives. So there you have it, a McKinley omelet. They love their breakfast um, especially. Okay, so our evaporated milk is boiling. And we're gonna put it right in here. And you are gonna add two fingers of whiskey. And my bowl is pretty full. So then you'll just mix this up, add it to your pie crust, bake it, add your um, chopped walnuts on top, and you will have a beautiful Saxon Sisters pumpkin pie uh, when you're all said and done. Okay, our last recipe uh, is gonna be the lobster salad. Now for their silver anniversary, uh, the McKinley's actually serve a hot lobster salad. Uh, so this evening we're going to just be making a cold lobster salad number one, which is one of the recipes uh, from the First Lady's cookbook, which is the original cookbook. Um, that I got at the thrift store they were talking about earlier. Um, 
And so we're just gonna make a lobster salad number one, which is basically just a very simple cold lobster salad. So if you look at your recipe cards, you're gonna prepare your lobster. Um, if you're gonna you know, buy your own lobster, cook all the meat, there you go. Next, what you're gonna do to do your dressing is you're going to take your two yolks of your hard boiled eggs right here. Um, and then you're gonna take your oil, um, mustard and seasonings and mix all of that together. Grab another spoon. And that will be your dressing. The rest of it is really easy to do because you're just basically decorating up your plate. Um, you can use the hearts of the lettuce as well um, to decorate your salad plate. So once you get your salad dressing all mixed up, then what you'll do is just put your lettuce on the plate and garnish that with hard boiled egg slices and lemon. Uh, now, one other weird thing that happened during the 1890s was uh, in 1896, this like giant carcass looking thing washed up on shore in St. Augustine, Florida. Uh, it was known as the Florida monster among other names. People thought it was like maybe this like giant octopus. Um, however, recent testing on it actually, um, this is a whole new word for me. I'm a history person, not necessarily a science type thing, but it turns out it wasn't a creature at all. It was a globster. Um, so I guess a globster is a un unidentified organic mass that washes up um, on shore. Uh, so uh, people were really freaked out by it. Uh, there aren't really, of course, any official pictures, but you can look up people's little drawings and sketches and whatnot online. So you can just kind of put your hard boiled eggs around here. We're going to top it with our lobster. And of course you can go, uh, you know, more so with this, you can put avocado with it, uh, really anything that you want. And then finally, you are gonna put, drizzle your dressing on top. So as I always like to say, during my live cooking programs, I thoroughly enjoy learning about the history of the First Ladies and history and presenting it uh, with cooking. It's such an interesting way to learn about cooking, uh, but I am also not a chef. Uh, so um, I just wanna say thank you guys so much for joining me tonight. I hope you learned a little bit about Ida and the fascinating time in which she lived. Um, and hopefully this has made you that when travel is all safe uh, to go visit the National Ladies uh, Historic Site uh, and to potentially learn more about Ida and the pre-progressive era, which was really fascinating. Um, I literally went down a rabbit hole uh, with that entire time period. Uh, so uh, again, thanks all so much. You can check out my Instagram uh, at Cooking with the First Ladies. Um, and hopefully I'll be posting some more content and doing some more for the National First Ladies coming soon. Uh, so thanks. Thank you, Sarah. You always do such an amazing job and I'm always so impressed at how multifaceted and talented you are with the PowerPoint and all of the interactives um, and cultural things that you hit on. And that, that you're able to um, do all of that cooking and share it with us. So as always, very impressive. And we're so excited to connect and uh, get more information out there about Ida McKinley. So I tried to pull together some of the questions people had. I was in the chat quite a bit, so I didn't get to see everything. But first of all, as always, people are asking, who is going to eat all that food tonight? <laughs> Luckily, um, I don't let anybody in the kitchen all day while I'm cooking. So, uh, we'll, this is, this is dinner tonight, uh, and definitely sharing with friends and neighbors over the you know next couple of days, especially with the pumpkin pies, because the other pumpkin pie will get made, 
Um, as soon as I'm not on camera and trying to stir in a bowl that I clearly uh, is not big enough. <laughs> and we are going to continue to share the link to the recipe cards. Uh, we send out an email um, after the program with the recipe cards. Unfortunately, we, you mentioned that, that um, we sent, I think there was some confusion about sending the cards. Um, we haven't published the cards yet, but it sounds like in the chat, there's a lot of interest in uh, some sort of collaboration and getting those recipes out there more. So I'm excited about that, but there will be a link that we'll send out via our constant contact to everyone who um, registered for tonight's program. We'll also put it on our Facebook and in YouTube. I know that some people couldn't stay for the whole talk, so we will share it there as well. Um, a few Ida related questions and then some cooking related questions that I might not be able to even ask correctly. First of all, um, for me to answer correctly. Right? So um, Ida's education. So so someone was asking about where Ida went to college and, and I just wanted you and I to clarify about her educational background because a lot of times at the National First Ladies Library when we talk about Ida we say she had all this education. She had the equivalent of a master's degree and I don't have the great graphic that one of my coworkers put together related to it, but she went to these women's finishing schools, correct? Um, do you want to yes. tell the audience a little bit more about that? Yeah, she went to several different schools, uh, one of them being the Brook Hall Seminary. I keep wanting to say cemetery. It's awful. Mm -hmm. I can't get it through my mind for whatever. But um, she, her, her dad specifically reached out to one of her teachers, Betsy uh, Cowles, and was like, I don't want her to have this formal education that all these other girls are having. You know, I want her to learn, you know, money and finance and kind of have more of a well-rounded education, especially for women at that time. So she didn't really go to college necessarily, right? Like, like you were saying, Allison, mm -hmm. but, you know, she was very formally educated more so than some at that time and more so than any of the first ladies um, before her. Um, so it's like what you're saying. It's like her equivalent mm -hmm. of what she would have today. Mm -hmm. But yeah, she went to several different schools and had lots of different experiences. And of course, she was very well traveled as well. So um, lots of opportunities being from a family of prominence. So the other question that people had um, was about her connection to Susan B. Anthony. And I know um, there's also chat about what, what kinds of books and resources you used. Um, we have mentioned and someone mentioned in the chat that the Carl Anthony book is really helpful in researching on Ida McKinley that he talks a little bit about the connection and relationship with Susan B. Anthony, but a lot of also what we found at National First Ladies Library is just doing research through um, newspapers from the past too. Can you tell us some of the sources, any other information that you found between those two women and learning about their connection or other resources you use to put your talk together tonight related to Ida? Yeah, um, definitely an easy question to say where I got a lot of my research, but, and it's, very, it's extensive. I mean, I couldn't even go through all of it, but, um, and we could have went on and on. I, my, uh, my original paper was so long that we'd be here for forever. Um, and I realized as we were going that it was going longer and longer. So I kept cutting things out. So I wish I could have done the whole thing, but, um, for, in regards to where I got my information, I did, I do get just a lot of it in, in general from, the National First Ladies uh, biographies um, on their website. Um, I also, with regards to Carl Anthony, um, I did watch there's a C-SPAN documentary on Ida McKinley, um, which I also, um, that's, I watched that and got a little bit from there. I do have the Carl Anthony book everybody's talking about. I did not have enough time to really get into it. Mm -hmm. um, and then beyond that, um, with just especially everything to do with the pre-progressive era was also just a lot of reading and research from various different uh, Library of Congress articles, different things like that. Um, and super shout out to Allison and Michelle up at the First Ladies Library because they really helped me out with some Ida pictures um, that were really neat and, and really nice to use in the PowerPoint as well. Um, with Susan B. Anthony, I didn't find personally a lot. I just know that she did throw her an 80th birthday party. Ida was extremely involved 
you know, kind of behind the scenes with the women's suffrage uh, movement. Um, she did, you know, want to make it known that she supported that. A lot of that came from her upbringing, from her kind of progressive parents, um, as well as uh, her progressive teachers. Um, they were all kind of forward thinking, especially for that time. Uh, so uh, really, I think that they just kind of had um, a relationship in that she supported that particular mm -hmm. cause in mm -hmm. some cases, but I don't, I didn't go too deep into it. So I'm sorry. No, you're fine. You're fine. And um, Betsy McCowles, I think was a, a suffragist in um, Ohio. So there's that connection too with her education and suffrage. So um, her father was pretty progressive and what he wanted her to learn and, and um, establishing that, uh, that, education background and that connection to suffrage. Um, so those were the Ida related questions that people had. And then um, the the one about the cooking, um, are there, um, and I'm sorry, cause I was answering a lot of questions. So um, one was about the, the um, omelet. And if you knew it now breakfast is kind of like every meal. So were, was the omelet something that would have been served for lunch or dinner too, or was it just a breakfast food? I think for them, they were just, they were very into breakfast. They started, they, like Ida for being, uh, you know, she's little, I mean, she's so cute, you know, I mean, and, and just what, I, but you know, she, she could eat. She was into it. They really just that big breakfast. Um, I, like I said, I'm not, you know, super culinary or anything, but I, I really think that it of a breakfast um, item for them. Now, in the First Lady's Cookbook, which I've got setting back there, um, the what they cooked for Ida in that cookbook was just eggs. Um, I think they were like fried eggs, um, maybe uh, with the, like I said, side of bacon. Um, I went with the turkey bacon um, and Johnny cakes, you know, which are kind of like a pancakey half roll type thing. Uh, and then, um, like I was saying, for, uh, towards the end of the program, uh, the PowerPoint was is that they were also um, one of the recipes that she passed along to a cookbook somewhere mm -hmm. up there in Ohio um, was for a, a kind of hash style uh, situation. Um, so I, I think with the omelet, they probably would have just been a breakfast thing. But so it, the, like they were the, saying today, we can eat breakfast all day. Yeah. <laughs> so are the chicken croquettes deep fried? Someone was asking. Yes, they are deep okay. fried. And I couldn't show that part because that's actually pretty easy too. But um, once you've got them in your cone, you've got them all rolled up and everything, you need to refrigerate them for at least two hours. Um, I actually ended up refrigerating mine overnight mm -hmm. um, and they were super easy. Um, you just uh, fill up, I filled up a little so like saucepan about the size of what I was using to do the milk, filled that up with oil and just took about two croquettes or whatnot at, at a time, dropped them in. They browned up about two-ish minutes and your chicken's already cooked. So that makes it a little easier too. And then you just yeah. drain them out and there you go. Your fancy chicken nuggets. So would Ida have broken out her air fryer for a recipe like this if she uh, Yeah, totally. It? She would have had the White House staff definitely do that, I think. So just because of her, like, you know, she was so wealthy growing up and she just wasn't in the kitchen. It just wasn't. Mm -hmm. So, but yeah, she would have broke out. You can, de you could probably definitely do these in an air fryer to make it easy. So that looks like what the major questions in the chat were. Um, as always, people are like, who is next? What's coming up for cooking with the first ladies? Uh, who are we going to be hearing for from soon? Uh, well, um, I don't know about between right now and uh, uh, is it April? End of April? Allison, I think so. Yeah, anyway, I need next to up them. for First Ladies, Cooking with First Ladies Live for the National for is Betty Ford. So I'm excited for that, of course. I am so super I will, excited to do that. I know we have Betty Ford and Nancy Reagan coming up. So we will post that on Eventbrite tonight and get that up and ready and going. And I will don mm -hmm. my mood ring and ERA pen and be so ready to talk about Betty Ford with you and yeah. the coming months. Yeah. And I know Nancy Reagan is on the horizon too. So I'm very yes. excited. Nancy's coming up as well. So a couple mm -hmm. really fascinating, more modern first ladies. Um,
but Ida's awesome. And uh, she was, uh, you know, a lot of times when you kind of have some of those first ladies from kind of back in the day, you don't, you know, know exactly a lot about them and you don't think there's so much about them, but really there, there's so much and they're just so interesting. And all of them, you know, are just such trailblazers for mm. their time. So she was awesome. And if you're super interested, you can go like, I know I learned for the first time about the Tierra when I came to visit the library this festival. And I just, that was just so awesome. And so you can go watch it on the Pawn Stars video. I know it's all set up and whatnot, but uh, it's kind of funny. And I know I included it on the PowerPoint, but it makes you as a history person. Um, and I'm sure some of y'all watching, and I know you, Allison, when he puts the Tierra on his head, it just is like so cringe. It's like, please, please don't do that. <laughs> I know, like, yeah, but I was really excited at your slide. I'm going to go back and, and watch it for sure. And yeah. someone in the chat, I think, um, said that that wing Tierra is a good look. People need to bring it back. So I think um, so. I think it would be a great accessory for a Zoom meeting to don a wing Tierra. Um, and it's really beautiful in person. So um, if you make it out to Canton, visit the McKinley Museum and the National First Lady's Historic Site and enjoy all things Ida McKinley. So thank you, Sarah Morgan. As always, this has been super fun and I, I wish we were in person again and sharing a cocktail and discussing First Ladies more, but I am happy to join you on Zoom as always. And I encourage people, if you didn't see the whole program tonight, you want to access it or you want to see Sarah's PowerPoint again and take notes like I am going to do tomorrow morning, um, head over to our YouTube page um, where it will be linked shortly or uh, connect up with us on Facebook. Um, National First Lady's Eventbrite page has all of our upcoming programs. In the chat, we have the links to the recipes and we will also be emailing those and I will be sure that that's included in the YouTube post as well. Um, if you ever have trouble connecting um, to a program, um, please reach out to us. Um, we are happy to connect with you and connect you to those recipe cards or our programs. And as always, we encourage you to um, dig into um, women's history. Thank you so much, and First Ladies especially. Uh, Sarah, thanks so much. This was so fun. Yay, thanks, y'all. Yay, we'll see you next time.